Chaksurunmilitanyena tasmai shri gurave namaha Vanchakaupatarubhyascha kripa sindhu bhai evacha patitanam bhavane bhyo vaishnavi bhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna everyone so this morning we'll just review what we've covered in the, the course of this uh, unit we began from chapter 7 and chapter 7 continued from the yoga ladder in chapter 6 you'd studied the yoga ladder and you'd heard how bhakti is at the top of the yoga ladder and that bhakti was the highest level of yoga. So chapter 7 begins with a discussion on bhakti yoga and Lord Krishna explains, you maybe, maybe you remember the first verse, the very first verse of the seventh chapter, Lord Krishna says to Arjuna, now hear from me, Arjuna. So Prabhupada said, yes, this, this is the important point, hearing. Hearing is the first step of bhakti yoga. We hear and then we chant and then we remember. So the other, just like the nine angas of bhakti, they're progressive, they follow one after the, the other. And so the Bhagavad Recording in progress. The Bhagavad Gita is also systematic and progressive. So after explaining the different yogas and the yoga ladder and the supremacy of bhakti yoga, chapter 7 begins emphasizing the process of bhakti by hearing. And Lord Krishna explains that by you, by hearing properly, you become free from doubt. So this was the very first verse of the seventh chapter. And as we heard yesterday, this section began, began by bhakti and it ended, it finished by bhakti. At the end of the twelfth chapter, it finished with bhakti. So that, that was the perfect... Uh, culmination of this unit because this central portion of the Bhagavad Gita is concerned with putting the emphasis on bhakti yoga rather than karma yoga which was emphasized in the first six chapters. The middle portion was bhakti and the end portion will be more on jnana. So sometimes people wonder that, oh, if bhakti is the important, why doesn't it come at the end? Because they think bhakti should be you know, the, the good thing, the best thing, the top thing should be at the end. That should be the, the finale of the Bhagavad Gita. But no, it's not like that. And Prabhupada explains, it says, it's like a sandwich. You know, when you eat sandwiches, I don't know, maybe some places they, they don't all eat sandwiches, but in England it's common, people eat sandwiches, they eat bread with something in the middle. You know, you put some nice thing in the middle, just like cake also, you get, you know, cream, a cream cake, you put the cream in the middle, and maybe you get cream donuts or something, you have the cream in the middle. So the good thing in the middle, and so bhakti is like that. And, the idea is that the karma yoga and the jnana yoga are the coverings, so they're protecting the bhakti. So this is the idea with the seventh chapter. So then the seventh chapter went on 
Lord Krishna describes his energies. You'll remember the energies of Lord Krishna, the elements of the material nature, and then he described also the living entities, that there's a superior, a superior energy. There's two kinds of prakriti, Krishna's nature, uh, his energy is prakriti, and there's, there's para prakriti and apara prakriti. So the superior prakriti is the living entities, and the, in, the apara prakriti, that's the elements of the material nature, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and ego. And then Lord Krishna describes, uh, well, in, actually earlier he described that many people may try for bhakti yoga, may try to take up the yoga process, but usually they, they come to impersonalism. By the path of knowledge often leads to impersonalism. But if they go on in the path of knowledge, then they'll come to surrender to Krishna. So Lord Krishna describes four kinds of people who surrender to him, and then four kinds of people who never surrender. Well, first of all, he describes four people who never surrender. They don't have any sukriti. And, but then he describes the four kind of pious people who come to him, they have some sukriti. They have sukriti, with a special sukriti which b brings them into devotional service. It's not just being pious. There are many pious people, but they're not all devotees. But if someone has a little sukriti in relation to devotees, then that brings them into devotional service. And Lord Krishna described that of the four kinds of people who come to him, the best one is the one in knowledge. Because one who has that knowledge, they will never forget Krishna, they'll never give up. Other people, you come in distress, or you come in search of wealth, or curious, they can go away after some time. But if one has knowledge, that knowledge will remain with them. So Lord Krishna describes, uh, then he goes on to talk about different kinds of worship and talks about how some people worship the universal form and then he speaks also about demigod worship but then he speaks about the devotee, the people who take to devotional service they're considered ultimately the best. So, the eighth chapter is more or less a continuation from the seventh chapter. At the end of the seventh chapter, Krishna used terms, some terms like Adi Yagna, Adi Daiva, uh, Adi Atma, so that was the beginning of the eighth chapter. Arjuna wanted to know about those terms. Now the eighth chapter is a short chapter, attaining the Supreme. Lord Krishna describes about reincarnation, that whatever we will remember at the end of life, that will be the cause, the, that will take us to the next life. And of course he says, one who can remember him at the end of life, then we, will, we can go to Krishna. We never need to take birth again. There's not a lot of important points in the eighth chapter. Anybody has any questions so far?
No. No good match. No rest. Okay. So. Lord Krishna does describe the nature of the material world and he talks about how this world is a place, a temporary world and it's full of miseries and the yogis never want to come back to this world. He describes also in verse 14, Ananya Bhakti. Ananya Bhakti, that's an important term because Ananya Bhakti means without deviation of the mind. So that's a very important. If we can somehow come to that level where our mind won't deviate, that we can always remember Krishna, then we can be sure of success. And we see text 14, Krishna describes like that. He said, I am easy to obtain, O son of Prita, because of his constant engagement in devotional service. This is a nice section actually in the 8th chapter. And so he talks about how we can attain, how we can attain him. And then material world is a temporary place of misery. And then text 16 it describes from the highest planet down to the lowest. We may think go to heaven it will be better. But no, he said from the highest planet down to the lowest. It's all repeated birth and death. So we don't want to be deviated. We want to understand the real goal which is to go back to Krishna. And then text 17 talks about the duration of the of uh, one age, Brahma's day, one day, Sahasra Yuga Paryantam Aharyad Brahmano Vidu. The one day of Brahma is a thousand ages taken together. And then the night is of the same duration. So the material world is like that. It's constant. Creation and destruction, creation and destruction. Again and again the day comes and again the night falls. So we should understand the nature of the material world. That there's no permanent situation anywhere here in this material world. We want to be convinced that the real goal of life is to get out from this world, to get to free ourselves from birth and death. And then the end of the eighth chapter, Krishna talks about leaving the body at different times. It's not really bhakti yoga, but Krishna then concludes, he said, for the devotee, it doesn't matter what time we leave the body. The devotees know that know these two paths, Arjuna. They're never bewildered. They're always fixed in devotion. So it doesn't matter when a devotee leaves, in the daytime or in the night. Because devotee means he's thinking of Krishna, he's hearing the holy name, he's sacrificed everything for Krishna's service. So it doesn't matter, there's no question of inauspiciousness for the devotee. And then chapter 9, the most confidential knowledge. Lord Krishna had been speaking about bhakti yoga. Now Krishna is going to give this important knowledge. Does anyone remember the link between the 8th chapter and the ninth chapter?
Krishna says that a, uh, a pure devotee solely fixes uh, his mind on uh, uh, Krishna in the 8th chapter. And uh, in ninth chapter, uh, he surpasses the light and darkness. Uh, um, ninth chapter? Ninth chapter, Krishna, uh, he talks about the different types of worshippers in the Aishwarya Dham and... Uh, um, exactly connection. He's going to give us the knowledge how to fix our mind on Krishna. Yeah. Or yeah. Confidential, yeah, from Guyam to more, uh, from Guyam to Guyataram and then to uh, Guyatamam. Yes, confidential, yeah, more. more confidential and most confidential, right? So confidential knowledge, where was that? What, what knowledge? The beginning chapter is about soul and the body. Yes, right. And then more confidential knowledge was? Chapter 7, seven and 8, eight. Where devotional service brings enlightenment in Krishna consciousness. Right. And now we're going to hear the most confidential knowledge. What, what is that most confidential knowledge? Relationship Be between non and devotees. Yes. Renuka? Relationship, relationship between Lord Krishna and devotees, transcendental dealings. 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 Yes, Lord Krishna says, even if you're the most sinful person, if you're situated on the boat of transcendental knowledge, you will deliver. And Lord Krishna says, I carry what you lack, I preserve what you have. And so this kind of dealing. And then the final verse is actually the most confidential knowledge. The final verse of the chapter is generally what we consider to be the most confidential knowledge. Engage your mind in thinking of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer obeisances unto me. And in this way, I promise you, surely you will come to me. And the, that verse at the end of the ninth chapter, that is repeated again in the 18th chapter. So that's the most confidential knowledge. So we heard also uh, that this knowledge, Raja Vidya, Raja Guna, it's the king of knowledge. It's knowledge for kings. And it's also Rajaguyam. It's confidential. Not everyone is able to understand it. We know when we present the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, not everyone is able to accept and to understand. So it's, it's confidential. So, in the ninth chapter, we hear also Lord Krishna explaining his uh, achintya beda beda tattva, that how he's everywhere, he's in everything, but at the same time he's outside of everything. For example, in the fourth chapter, he said, "By me, in my unmanifested form, the entire universe is pervading. All beings are in me." But I am not in them. So this is Krishna's achintya, beda beda. That he's one, he's there everywhere in the universe, at the same time he's outside of the universe. So he appears. But at the same time, he, he keeps himself aloof from the material world. In text number six, he said, Understand, as the mighty wind blowing everywhere always rests in me, all living entities rest. Oh, oh as the mighty wind blowing everywhere, rests 
Always in the sky, all created beings rest in me. So Krishna gives examples like this to help us to understand his all-pervading nature and his omnipotent nature. We have uh, text number 10. Describing that the material nature is working under the control of Krishna. It's not independent. Everything is under the direction of Lord Krishna. And although Krishna is directing everything, he's always a person, he has a human form, and he even comes to this world. So text 11 is another significant verse, often quoted, Krishna describing that the foolish think of me like an ordinary person. They do not understand my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all the three. And Prabhupada gives quite a lengthy purport to that verse. There's one, two, three, nearly four pages purport. So we can understand that's a very significant verse because Prabhupada elaborated on it. And the results of that impersonalism is described there, text number 12. That you'll never be successful, whatever you do. Then Krishna gives some examples of his all-pervading nature. His, like what we heard in uh, chapter 10, Krishna's vibhutis. So we have some vibhutis given here in chapter 9. Krishna said, I am the father of the universe, the mother, the support. I am the object of knowledge, the sacrifice, and the symbol Om. So Krishna is describing his, some of his vibhutis. We'll get more of that, of course, in the 10th chapter. Just giving us a taste for these things. Then text 22 is that yoga kshima vahamiyaham. Krishna describes his reciprocation with his pure devotees, right? Not with everyone, but those who are completely dedicated to Krishna, then Krishna dedicates himself to them. Text number 22 says, those who always worship me on my transcendental form, and I preserve what they have. So this is uh, an example of the loving reciprocation between the Lord and his pure devotees. And Krishna talks about worshipping in the wrong way. The people who worship the demigods, they're worshipping Krishna, but in the wrong way. So, avidi purvika. And the results of demigod worship, you go to the planets of the demigods. So you worship demigods, it's quite a complicated affair. You have to arrange many things to offer to them. But then, in text 26, 
Lord Krishna describes how it's so easy to worship Him. You just have to offer a leaf, a flower, a fruit or even water. And if you, have, if you offer them with love and devotion, then Krishna will accept them. Of course, we shouldn't be satisfied to just offer these basic things to Krishna. If we can offer more to Krishna, certainly we should. But the idea is Krishna wants us to begin the offering. Remember when we were talking about this verse, Prabhupada, we gave the example, Prabhupada told the story about how the sadhu came begging at the home and the lady thought, oh, I'll give you ashes. And so the, the sadhu said, all right, yes, give me ashes. He thought very good, he, he thought ashes, and then at least she's starting to give. And so the same way, Prabhupada related that story to this verse. It said in the same way, Krishna is starting us to give something. You can offer a leaf, a, a flower, a fruit, water. You just give something that's the beginning of devotion. And gradually go on and we'll, give, we'll do better and give more. So that was 26, that's also describing bhakti, devotion, but 27 talks about karma yoga. Verse 27 talk, speaks, it comes down the yoga ladder and Krishna says, uh, whatever you do, whatever you offer and give away, do it as an offering to me. So karmarpanam, offering the results of your work to Krishna. It's not bhakti yoga, that's karma yoga. So you can see, sometimes Krishna moves around a bit, sometimes speaking about one thing and speaking about another thing. It's not always so fixed on the one point. Text 29 is another nice verse describing Krishna's relationship with, the, with everyone. He said, I envy no one, I'm equal to all. But if someone does some service to me, so Krishna highlights the, the importance that if someone's actually devoted and doing service for him, then Krishna has a special interest in them. Not just, it's not ordinary because someone's actually doing some service. And then we see text 30, Krishna speaks about even one does some abominable action. So someone's engaged in some kind of sinful activities and sometimes it's difficult for them to get out of the habit of engaging in sinful activities. But Krishna says, if they're properly situated in renunciation, then Krishna can deliver them. If he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. So he's situ properly situated in his determination because he has some devotion, he has some devotion, but at the same time, he has some bad habits. So, he hates himself for having the bad habits and gradually he will overcome them. And Krishna goes on to say in 31, he quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. And then Krishna speaks that famous verse, famous statement, Kuntiya priti janehi nami bhakta pranashati. So Krishna's describing how he really cares about his devotee. And that even though he may have been sinful, he had so many bad habits, but he attains lasting peace because Krishna promises my devotee will never perish. And Krishna told Arjuna, tell everyone Arjuna.
then this chapter then goes on to speak about other people, even they be of low, low birth, they can also attain the supreme destination. Women, Sudra, Vaishya, they can all attain the supreme destination. Krishna consciousness is for everyone. There's no distinction that somebody's qualified, somebody's always not qualified. No, it's nothing to do with birth. The, the important feature is the sincere desire to want to serve Krishna. And anyone who has that sincere desire, then they can be delivered by the grace of Krishna. Of course, we may be of low birth, but then there are other people, the saintly kings and the brahmanas, and of course, they're much better. It's much easier for them. Having come to this temporary material world, engaging, engage in loving service unto me. So if someone has a good birth, they should take advantage of that to take shelter of Krishna. Somehow you're born in a family of saintly devotees, maybe Brahmana or saintly king. It's a great opportunity to perfect your life. Unfortunately, you usually find such people don't take advantage. They may have been born in a family of great sages and then they become meat eaters. They're from a line of saintly kings and they're just simply materialists, attached to sense gratification. And then at the end of chapter 9 we have that most confidential knowledge Krishna is describing. You just have to do these four things, very simple things. And in this way we will be sure to come to Krishna. Simple things. Offering obeisances, worshipping Krishna, becoming a devotee, and engaging our mind to think of Krishna. So it's important for us, hearing and practicing chanting and remembering. So Krishna described the most confidential knowledge. Then chapter 10, because Krishna had said in the most confidential knowledge, we had to engage our mind in thinking of him. So in chapter 10, Arjuna wants to know how to think of Krishna. How can a common person think of Krishna? Ordinary people, they may not understand the divine nature of Krishna. So how can they think of Krishna? How can people, ordinary people who don't believe, may, they may not even believe in God. They may not understand that God is a person and he has a spiritual form. So how can such people think of God? So. Our Lord Krishna spoke this 10th chapter, chapter 10, Vibhuti Yoga, and all the different opulences of Lord Krishna are described. Of course, prior to that, uh, Lord Krishna had also spoken the four verses which summarize the Bhagavad Gita, what we call the Chatur Sloki of the Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna had spoken those four verses and when Arjuna heard those four verses, well the four verses first of all, the first verse is knowledge of the relationship or Sambandha Gyan and then the second verse is describing the process of Bhakti Yoga, Machada Madgata Prana, right? That's the process of Bhakti Yoga. The, the devotees derive great satisfaction and bliss, enlightening one another and conversing about me. And then 
text number uh, 11, or 10 and 11, they're describing cryogena, or the goal. Sambandha again. Not Sambandha, Abhidha, Prayogena, Prayogena, the goal of life, Prayogena. So, texts 10 and 11 are describing Prayogena Gyan, the goal of Bhakti Yoga, which is to develop that love for Krishna. So, Krishna describes in text 10, to those who are constantly devoted to me and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they may come to me. And then text 11, out of compassion for them, I dwelling in their heart, destroy the darkness of born of ignorance with the lamp of knowledge. So that was the Chatur Sloki, and when Arjuna heard these, these statements from Lord Krishna, he, he was hearing Lord Krishna say, everything comes from me, material and spiritual. And he was hearing also the importance of engaging in, in devotional service. So Arjuna became inspired and he understood Krishna's divinity. And he described Krishna as being the supreme Brahman, the supreme abode. And he describes, not only am I saying that, but I know that in the past, other great sages like Asita and Devala and Narada and Vyas, they all accepted this. They all said this about you. And so then Arjuna says, I totally, I totally accept this, this truth, all that you have told me, Keshava. And then Arjuna requests Krishna, just kindly tell us, how common people can think of you in this world, in the material world. And on that basis, then Krishna begins to describe his vibhutis. And a big list, so many different vibhutis are mentioned. So that was text number 10. Lord Krishna had spoken about his vibhutis. And then text number 11 comes and Arjuna wants to actually see the vibhutis. He said, you know, you've, you've told me, you've, you've established yourself philosophically, but I want you to establish yourself uh, theoretically now. Not just theoretically, I want you to practically show me how you're the Supreme. So, you know, it's one thing to see, to speak, but we have to prove it. It's not just only saying things, we want to show it. So Arjuna, Arjuna, he was convinced about Lord Krishna's position, but he wanted Krishna to do something so that it would be a challenge to other people who may come along and claim that they are also Krishna and that they are also supreme. Therefore, Arjuna was requesting Lord Krishna that he should show his Vishwarupa, the universal form. And of course that's what happened. Lord Krishna showed his universal form and he showed also his Kala Rup, the form of time. Now the form of time was showing, when Arjuna saw the form of time it was frightening to him because he saw so many of the uh, people who he knew, who he was going to fight with, he saw them entering into the mouths of the universal form, into the form of the Kala Rup. He saw Bhishma and Drona and Karna, how they were all being killed, and he saw how all the different state, statesmen, they were all dying also on this battle. So, it was a great fright. It was very uh, terrifying to Arjuna in some ways. And it was so frightening to Arjuna, Arjuna became bewildered and he asked Krishna, who are you? Although Krishna and Arjuna had been friends for a long time, they'd grown up together, Arjuna asked Krishna, who are you? 
And then Lord Krishna speaks his famous statement that time I am the destroyer of the world and I come to claim all people but for you and the Pandavas everyone else is going to die. And then Lord Krishna also asked Arjuna, become an instrument in my service, nimita matra bhavasavya sachin. Lord Krishna wants Arjuna to understand the desire, his Krishna's desire. He wants Arjuna to become his servant, to take up Lord Krishna's mission. And part of that mission was to remove the Kauravas and put the Pandavas on the throne. Arjuna was to be empowered by Krishna to perform this act. In the battle of Kurukshetra, it was Arjuna who was responsible for killing many of these people. So Arjuna saw the Kalarupa and it was not pleasing to him and after offering prayers he requested Krishna, kindly show me your forearm form. And on hearing this request from Arjuna, Krishna revealed the forearm form and then Arjuna then requested Krishna, kindly show me your original form, your two-arm form. And then Krishna again showed his two-arm form, the form of Shamsunda playing the flute, threefold bending form. We can understand from this incident that it is Lord Krishna who is the supreme form of the Lord. And the universal form is a temporary material manifestation. But it helps people to understand that there is a superior nature in this world. We want people to take up Krishna consciousness and not everyone can understand Lord Krishna as God. So let them understand Krishna as the universal form. And in this way let them become the servant of Krishna. The importance of that universal form is that one will take up service. So Lord Krishna showed his two-arm form to Arjuna and then we see at the end of the chapter, the, this eleventh chapter, Lord Krishna describes, first of all, that he can only be understood by devotion. And then in the final chapter, he describes that uh, we have to work to understand Krishna. We should work. We should not be idle. Krishna consciousness is not about sitting around being idle. But there's a lot of work, a lot of things to be done for the service of Krishna. And this is the conclusion of the 11th chapter, that mat karma krim, eh? Krishna karma, Prabhupada speaks about Krishna karma, working for Krishna. So seeing the universal form was meant to inspire people to the, that they should work for Krishna. Not that they should think I am God and sit and do nothing. But they should understand, I am a servant of God and I should engage in the service of the Supreme. So that was the end of the 11th chapter and then chapter 12, which we covered yesterday and it began with Arjuna's question and he wanted to know which was better, those who worship your personal form or those who, or those who worship you in your unmanifested form. And Lord Krishna responds very clearly that those who worship his, him personally, they're the best. They're the most dear to Lord Krishna. And those who worship this impersonal, unmanifested aspect of Krishna, they have a struggle. They have a hard time. Very difficult for them to progress 
very difficult for them to focus on the unmanifested, the infinite. Why? Because we have a body, because we have no experience of the unmanifested, impersonal nature. So it's a very big challenge for us to think of something which is unmanifested and impersonal. It's much easier for us to take up bhakti yoga and to serve Krishna. And Lord Krishna certainly emphasized that in replying to Arjuna's question. And then we see Lord Krishna describe different levels of engaging in devotional service. He, first of all, he said, one who can think of me always without deviation, then that's the best, that's the topmost level. But if you can't do that, then one step down is to practice the regulative principles of bhakti yoga. Because by doing bhakti yoga, gradually we will come to attain Krishna. So bhakti yoga will help us to fix the mind on Krishna. And bhakti yoga means not just simply following the four principles and chanting six, 16 rounds. Bhakti yoga means engaging in the service of the deity and offering arti and cooking for the deity and studying the scriptures like Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and chanting the holy name as well. All of these activities make up bhakti yoga. But not everyone can do that. If you ask people, just, you know, just stay in the temple, just chant and do kirtan all day and do service for the deities, they'll do it for some time and then they become restless and they want to go away again. And then, so what, what can they do? Then one step down from bhakti yoga is karma yoga. Learn to offer the results of your work to Krishna. And by offering the results of our work to Krishna, gradually we will become purified and we will become more qualified to engage in the service of Krishna and to take up bhakti yoga. But not everyone can do karma yoga. As we heard yesterday, sometimes there are, there are objections, sometimes the family members or different reasons. Maybe, maybe, for example, someone may be born in some other religion, a non-Hindu religion, and the family members don't like. They say, oh, this Krishna consciousness, this is some Hindu religion. Don't give money to them. Don't support them. So you cannot do service, you cannot do karma yoga. Then we're encouraged to give charity and to help others. Because by doing some welfare activities, although it's mundane and material, it will help us to develop the mood of detachment. If we just work and keep all the money, enjoy it ourselves, we'll become very attached. But when we give for the service of the different societies, then you become a little detached. So that's, that's good, this, some purification is coming about by sacrificing your hard-earned money. Of course, the best is that we can sacrifice it for the service of Krishna, but there may be some impediments, there may be some restrictions, you may not be allowed to do that. So then, do charity for some other cause, and that will help. And then other things you can do like meditation, renunciation, these things will gradually purify us and bring us to the transcendental platform. So those different stages were described there in chapter 12, from text 8 up to chapter, up to text 12. 
Oh, of course, one point also which was mentioned there in that 12th chapter, Lord Krishna said that he is the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. Lord Krishna, we showed the picture, Krishna coming on the back of Garuda and picking up the devotee from the ocean of material existence. So we, we cannot cross the ocean of material existence by our own endeavour. We need the mercy of Krishna. And we have to attract the mercy of Krishna by good sadhana, by engaging in nice activities for Krishna's pleasure. And then Krishna will deliver us from this ocean of material existence. I think that's chapter 12, text number 6. And then the end of chapter 12, we heard qualities of a devotee which endear him to Lord Krishna. And we heard about many different examples of Srila Prabhupada, how he displayed these kinds of qualities how he's not attached to wealth or fame or anything like that. He simply wants to give pleasure to Krishna. And he writes in the preface of Bhagavad Gita, he said, if even one person becomes a devotee, that will be, that will be great, that will be wonderful. We should never be discouraged. I just some, just yesterday somebody told me, they said they wanted to go online and do some program online, but they said only two people registered. I said, only two people? I said, you're lucky you got two people. You've got two people, there's two devotees. You should be eager to preach to them. Don't cancel, oh, two people is not many people. No, if you, two people is very good. We say, one moon is better than millions of stars. You may have so many stars in the sky, but one moon is better than all these stars. So if you, get, if you can make two devotees, wow, it's really good. Just to make, a, to make devotees, to bring people to Krishna consciousness. It's so special. It's so rare. And so we should take every opportunity to give Krishna consciousness to others and to, to share whatever we have with others. Don't give back, don't hold back. Don't think, oh no, I should get more people, there should be a bigger crowd. <laughs> no, it's not like that. It doesn't matter how many people we get. Don't be attached. Prabhupada went to the West. Look at Prabhupada, how Prabhupada struggled. One time they arranged a big program for Prabhupada. They rented a big hall in New York and the devotees went. And the, the, but nobody else came hardly. So the devotee apologized to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, we're very sorry. We couldn't get many people to come for your program. And, but Prabhupada said, what do you mean? Didn't you see Narada Muni? Didn't you see Lord Brahma? They both came. They were both here for the program. And Prabhupada told us, actually, if you go to London Temple in Soho Street in London, in central London, we have a temple there, and there, there are two seats at the side of the altar. Prabhupada instructed these seats should be put there, for one for Lord Brahma and one for Narada Muni, because he said sometimes they like to come for our arti, come for the program. So give them a seat. So, you know, we, we don't know who's coming, actually, who's there. But just to be able to speak about Krishna, that is our pleasure. So, uh, Prabhupada, uh, the Lord Krishna describes these different qualities of the devotee, which are very endearing to him. That they, they tolerate so many difficulties. They struggle so hard and they don't keep material possessions. We heard no home, no place to live, homeless. But that's not a problem for a devotee. The, the problem is simply to remember Krishna. To, well, 
for the pure devotee, of course, that's not a problem. His concern, the problem is to save the other souls, to, to how to deliver the conditioned souls from their plight. Those who are suffering in the material world, how to deliver them. We see that kind of prayer in Prahlad Maharaj in Second Canto Srimad Bhagavatam. Prahlad said, I'm not worried about myself. Wherever I go, I can simply chant the holy name and I can be happy. But I'm worried about all these other people who, have, who are simply attached to the home and their bank balance and they're only thinking about their sense gratification. He said, I worry about them, that what will happen to them? So this is the mood of the devote, pure devotees. We want to develop these kind of qualities. We, we need to hear about these activities, these devotees, these qualities, and we want to appreciate them. And gradually we can also begin to cultivate these kind of qualities. All right, so that would say at the chapter 12 ends with devotion. It began, the chapter 7 began with devotion. Chapter 12 ends glorifying the mood of devotion. So are there any, any questions, any problems for anyone? Actually, uh, by the prayer of the Prahlad Maharaj, uh, Narsimhadev took all the souls to Vaikuntha. So we are from, I think, of the Brahman. Other universes. I, I, I couldn't catch everything you said, Prabhu. You said Prahlad Maharaj wanted to, took everybody to Goloka, but? Everybody actually went to uh, Golok. And uh, the, the, this uh, planet became a vacuum. So other uh, creatures, uh, other souls came from the other Brahmandas, people like us. <laughs> We came from the other Brahmandas. <laughs> yeah, just like uh, Vasudev Datta wanted to take the karma to deliver all the conditioned souls. And so Lord Chaitanya said, yes, all right, we already, I've already delivered them. But he said, you know, and they've already gone back to Godhead by your desire. They all went back. But more people have come. As you say, we came from other Brahmanan, Brahm, Brahmanandas. But from other universes, we've come here. And so similarly, when Vasudev Datta prayed, Lord Chaitanya delivered everyone in response to his prayer. And so many other conditioned souls came and filled up the universe. Right. So there's always so much work to be done. That's why Narada Muni is always traveling, preaching. There's always so many conditioned souls to be delivered. Yes. So we can never think, oh, everyone's saved. No, there's so much to be done. All right, is that a hand up I see here? Is it, Madhuri? Yes. Yes. Ras Gary Prabhu has a question, Guru Maharaj. Uh -huh. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, uh, actually, uh, when I was reading about this uh, impulse, um, this um, uh, unmanifested form of the Lord, so I was just reading that they, uh, to know that you have to uh, understand the language, uh, learn the language of that form and understand the non-conceptual feelings and then realize all these processes. So what, do, what does it exactly mean learning the language of the um, uh, unmanifested form or the non-perceptual feelings? Well, I think when they talk about learning the language, they talk about the language which is used in the scriptures to describe these things, which is Sanskrit. So you, you'd have to learn Sanskrit, and then you have to, yeah, you would have to try to understand the descriptions there. As it's mentioned, you know, the, the unmanifested, impersonal, it, it, not easy things to describe. So, to try to understand the language in which these things are explained is also somewhat bewildering. 
Yeah, it's difficult for us to understand what is non-perceptual feelings. Uh. Yes, non-perceptual feelings, right? Just hearing about these things, you know, wow, what do they mean? Mm. And uh, at one more place about this unmanifested form, it says that um, and that which lies beyond the perce perception of senses, the all-pervading inconceivable. All pervading, inconceivable, I'm able to get, but after that, say they're saying unchanging, fixed, and immobile. So I'm not able to perceive what, what this unmanifested form is unchanging, fixed, and immobile. Unchangeable, immovable. The unmanifested form is unchanging, fixed, and immovable. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have any form, so how could it be changing anyway? Yeah. If it, there's no form there. How is it going to change? Immovable. Well, the soul is also described as immovable. It's situated in the heart. It doesn't move. But at the time of death, of course, it leaves the body. So how do we understand this idea of the impersonal Brahman? So these are just statements, qualities, we just have to hear about these things. We just have to hear, again, it's not that we can fully realize everything which is being described there, but still we want to hear, we, we hear about it, and gradually, you know, we begin to accept. You know, there was a famous pastime, one, one devotee lady, she was reading the Bhagavatam, and she came to a sentence and she asked Prabhupada, what did it mean? And she, Prabhupada said, read it again. So she read the sentence again. It, it was, the moon was churned from the ocean of milk, right? And so Prabhupada said, read it again. And she said, the moon was churned from the ocean of milk. And he said, read it again. And she said, the moon was churned from the ocean of milk. And Prabhupada said, now do you understand? And she said, yes, Prabhupada, the moon was churned from the ocean of milk. Prabhupada said, yes. Right? <laughs> so understanding, you know, understanding sometimes just means that we, we have to repeat what's said there. Not always that we can fully appreciate everything. And uh, so Brahma Jyoti, uh, Brahma Jyoti part of the spiritual sky, no, I just wanted to confirm yeah, that. Yeah, uh, Brahma Jyoti is the spiritual sky, but within the Brahma Jyoti there are spiritual planets, right? The Brahma Jyoti, we say that's actually the effulgence coming from the body of Lord Krishna. And the Brahma Jyoti is spread everywhere in the spirit, spiritual sky. Yeah. Maharaj, you said the spiritual planets are also there in the Brahma Jyoti. Is it a part of the Vaikuntha or uh, Brahma Jyoti? The spiritual planets, uh, the, well, Vaikuntha, there, huh? yeah, they're all situated within the Brahma Jyoti. It's an all pervading light, but within that, there are the spiritual planets and Vaikuntha planets. There's an unlimited number of Vaikuntha planets. And then there's the supreme planet, Goloka. And Goloka is in the form of a lotus flower. So that's above even Vaikuntha, is Goloka. It's more confidential. So, Lord, Maharaj, Yes? Maharaj, we would just like to thank you for your wonderful, amazing classes. We just... Very, yeah, we just love your classes and we really wish, hope and wish and pray that you come for our next batch also. Means, next uh, units. Yeah, next units. All also the units. <laughs> means, oh, oh, we have so many better speakers than me. I'm not very good. But, uh, uh, concepts yeah. were made very clear and uh, means this much of clarity. Uh, it, was, it was our pleasure oh. to have, means, oh. have you as a teacher and it's an honor. I mean, it's Maharaj, we are grateful to you and your lotus feet. Please bless us so that our mind will be at the lotus feet of Lord and all Vaishnavas. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes, may you be blessed. Please continue, study nicely, and then preach also. After you learn this, then you go on and teach this also yourself. We need more teachers. Sure, Maharaj. Sure. Very good.
Hare Krishna. All right. So, so I think... Maharaj, I'll... Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Just a wonderful class, Maharaj. Thank you very much for your wonderful class, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu, for your participation. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you, Maharaj. Sorry? What did you say, Prabhu? Good to meet you, Maharaj. As a point, and Yashoda Mataji also wanted to say something. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I totally agree that you made my mind so clear. There were so many things, despite having studied Bhagavad Gita so many times, you made it so clear. I only desire that if you could continue the other units as well to make our bhakti part more and more <laughs> lively and so that we can totally surrender unto Guru Krishna, please. Hare Krishna. Please request. I have kind request that we can continue. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words and thank you for your participation. Hare Krishna. Ma Maharaj, I have one question from chapter 10. Uh -huh. It's a uh, text 4 and 5. It's Krishna says intelligent knowledge, freedom from doubt and delusion, forgiveness, truthfulness, control of the senses, control of the mind, happiness, distress, birth, death, fear, fearlessness, non-violence, equanimity, satisfaction, austerity, charity, fame and infamy. All these various qualities of living beings are created by me alone. Maharaj, can you give a little uh, explanation on this verse, please? Oh, yeah? Um, chapter 10? So that's speaking yes. about the different qualities of different, you know, different varnas and ashrams that have different qualities, you see? Thank you. It's not going to be the same for everyone. But mm -hmm. all of these different things are there. What text number is it again? Four and five. Four and Chapter five. ten. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Intelligence, knowledge, freedom from doubt. Yes. So? We want to understand everything comes from Krishna, so these different qualities are also there. Forgiveness, truthfulness, but then they mention also non-violence, enmity, hmm. austerity, charity. Yeah, so different things, you see, just like Austerity. Now who's going to do austerity? Austerity is meant to be done by sannyasis and vanaprastas. Austerity is not for young people really. And charity, who's supposed to do charity? That's supposed to be done by the, you know, like the Vaishyas, the businessmen, the people okay. with the wealth. And of course, Grihastas also. They also give charity. Their charity is to chant the holy name, go for Sankirtan and give the holy name. Charity is not just giving wealth, but giving the holy name. That's the greatest wealth which we can give actually. So charity can be done by uh, people, and, you know, if you go for heart, Sankirtan, go out on Sankirtan, chant the holy name, tell people. Sometimes we give books also. It's also charity. Hmm. So these these different things. All right. F uh, happiness and distress, birth, death. Fear, fearlessness, non-violence, equanimity. Uh, non-violence. Non-violence, of course, that's more for, well, it wouldn't be for kshatriyas, you know. Kshatriyas, they're supposed to be violent. They're supposed to use violence. But non-violence, it will depend. In general, sometimes even brahmanas, they have to perform animal sacrifices. They do things like that. And so, 
But generally, nonviolence is a, a, a devotee principle. The devotees want to cultivate that kind of quality. We don't encourage violence. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh huh. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Maharaj. I would like to say something, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you so much, Maharaj. I have not read uh, uh, from chapter 7 onwards. In our Bhagavad Gita class, we are till chapter 6 now. So, uh, really, thank you so much. It was so wonderful to hear, uh, learn so much from 7 to 12. I had no idea about uh, uh, a lot of things. I've heard many classes, but I've never studied it uh, uh, like personally. I only studied till chapter 6. So, you made it so clear and I quite got a good understanding of these chapters. Especially one more thing, because I'm trying, I'm starting a Bhagavad Gita class with, with my friends. And what you said is that even two, two, two deep people are uh, okay to start a class. I was, I was in my mind thinking, okay, if I have four or five, I will start a class. Otherwise I won't. But now I've already got two friends of mine who want to study Bhagavad Gita. So I'll start with them. So oh. thank you. This has been a, in my mind to start or not to start, but just with two, two friends. And now today you made it so clear. So I'm going to start from the week after next. Oh, very, thank you, Mona. It was good. very nice. Very and we good. look forward for your association in Hong Kong soon. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when, but... <laughs> it's soon, Marat, soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, when Hong Kong opens a bit. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you. Thank Hare you. Krishna. Okay, so thank you all very much and wish you all good luck with your study in Bhakti Shastri and I'm sure we'll meet again in different places. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinash Narasimha Maharaj Ki. Jai. Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda Ki. Jai. 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 J